Hello. Uh, yeah, this presentation will be a little bit different than uh, most of the others at this conference, um, but I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to talk a little bit about stories, and I want you to keep in the back of your mind that it matters which stories we use to tell other stories with. So, most cultures have origin myths. Stories about where we came from and who we are are pretty fundamental to the human experience. However, a unified origin myth for humanity as a species is a pretty universal, <laughs> pretty ambitious project. It's the kind of project inspired by looking for objective stories to tell, also known as scientific epistemology. And what we have managed to produce is an interesting mix of scientific empiric knowledge and cultural myth-making. So starting with some of that handy scientifically produced knowledge, our story begins in the temperate and tropical regions where hominids first evolved into human beings. The principal food of the species was vegetable. About 65 to 80% of what early humans ate was gathered. Only in the extreme Arctic was meat the staple food. Now most of us have in our minds images of cave paintings of spectacular mammoth hunters. The men with the spears and the arrows that secure the food and protect the family. This being the traditional and some have proposed evolutionary role of men in our society. However, there are actually not that many early cave paintings of hunting large beasts. There are a lot more paintings of animals, remarkably anatomically correct depictions of animals, in what some would say are reverent renditions. What early humans actually did to stay alive was eat sprouts, shoots, nuts, fruits, berries, bugs, mollusks. They probably snared some rabbits and fish and birds to up the protein. And they didn't work very hard at it. They worked a lot less hard than peasants in someone else's field after agriculture was invented. Archaeologists have studied populations of skeletons from locations in early farming, and they discovered common trends of malnutrition, um, decreases in height, high infant mortality rates. Um, and the early people probably worked a lot less hard than paid workers once civilization was invented. They probably could have made a good living out of about a 15-hour work week. And a 15-hour work week leaves a lot of time to do other things. So much time that maybe the ones that didn't have a baby around to enliven their life or skill in making or cooking or singing songs or just really interesting thoughts to think decided to go off and hunt mammoths. And the skillful hunters would come staggering back with a load of meat, a load of ivory, and a story. And it was really the story that made the difference, not the meat. It's hard to tell a really gripping tale about how I husked a wild oat from its, or I, yeah, I husked a wild oat, and then I husked another, and I husked another, and then I scratched my gnat bites, and my friend said something funny, we went to the creek, and then I found another wild oat patch. It doesn't really compete with how we stalked a wild beast, and then I thrust my spear deep into its gigantic hairy flank, and it impaled me on its huge tusk, and I writhed, and torrents of crimson blood spurted everywhere, and Bob got crushed to jelly when the mammoth fell on him, and right at the crucial moment, I shot my arrow straight through its eye to its brain. That story not only has action, it has a hero, and heroes are powerful. Although, un arguably unnecessary and sometimes counterproductive. <laughs> Maybe it's time that we told a different story about how we got here. We could focus more on cooperation instead of competition in the process of becoming human. And we could investigate what drives civilizations 
beyond an epic story about struggle for the survival of the fittest, a story that happens to suit capitalist accumulation and alienation so well. Conflict, competition, struggle may well be seen as necessary elements of a whole, but the whole itself cannot be characterized either as conflict or as harmony because the purpose is neither resolution nor stasis, it's continuing process. And that is the struggle of sustainability. And I'd like to situate the idea of a pursuit of sustainability by asking what is to be sustained and for whom? When we refer to a universal humanity, it tends to obscure practices of inclusion and exclusion. There isn't really an us that is in all of this together. <laughs> so, the story I played with just now was meant to illustrate the dubious nature of claims about inevitability and necessity and progress. As path dependent as current arrangements might seem, especially when it comes to conflict and violence, they are always open to negotiation and transformation. But in order to make a better future, we have to pay attention to the potentials for being otherwise. And to take the properties of emergence seriously would mean that we're open to the idea of what will have been possible. The stories that we tell ourselves about the past inform our imagination of the future. And in a way, both the past and the future unfold from the now. And the now is a pretty precarious place. Geologists have decided that we now live in the epic called the Anthropocene. In order to uh, demark global regimes of climate, but also biochemical circulation disturbances. And there have been other names proposed as well, such as the Capitalocene or the Plantationocene, or my favorite, the Cthulhucene. <laughs> Marketing is also a form of storytelling. So this is Sam Palmsano from IBM unveiling the Smarter Planet agenda. And he invokes smart growth not only as possible and desirable, but also as required and urgent if we want to prevent sudden, further sudden collapses of our life supporting systems on the one side and to sustain our competitiveness on the globalized market on the other. Advocates for framing sustainability as a problem that can be described, confronted, and resolved with technology also tend to argue that there is a need for a steady growth in consumption, which can only be provided through technological innovation. In that way, the values and goals of sustainability become assimilated into the paradigm of economic growth. And the unchallenged virtues of consumption and competition are fundamental ingredients to the attraction of these solutions. So under the auspices of a crisis scenario, we are told that there is neither need nor time for deep reflection over our current predicament. We are assured that innovators can perpetually provide us with new and desirable products, foster market opportunities, and simultaneously clean up and protect our biosphere. Now, it's my argument that these solutions are comfortable because they don't confront institutionalized practices of inequality and violence. Citizens from the richest countries are encouraged to continue going about their lives and allow technology and the corporations that produce it to sustain their lifestyles in whichever way impedes on them the least. At the same time, the necessary activities to sustain those lifestyles, including counterinsurgency, mass surveillance, hypersecure borders, and a rapidly growing industry for necrotechnology, continues. There's, <laughs> uh, if technological innovation is optimistic in terms of a framework for sustainability, its counterpart is securitization, which is ultimately, is the ultimate pessimism. Securitization is both military in the sense that 
uh, militaries, particularly the United States military, has been planning for climate change since the 1980s. Um, and their position is that the vulnerable populations of the world are themselves the threat, um, and as well as instability in these vulnerable places. They are the threat to the lifestyles of people in the richest countries, and thus their aim is to secure those resources and exclude people from, um, from accessing them in the future. Domestically, we now have a category called eco-terrorism. The FBI has named eco-terrorism as the largest domestic threat to the United States, which is pretty interesting considering that eco-terrorists have never murdered anyone. What they do do is threaten private property. The definition of eco-terrorism is any destruction of private property motivated by environmental beliefs. Re most recently, the protesters at the Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, or the Native American water protectors, as they call themselves, have been charged with eco-terrorism for their nonviolent protests. There's also a common thread between securitization and the attractiveness of technological innovation as solutions to sustainability. And that is a form of masculinity that not only protects its own like its own privilege, but also its identity. So the way that you interpret information is different depending on the groups you belong to, is the idea. So it's not just about rejecting information because you know that, it, that you're winning in this situation. The idea is that you're cognitive, cognitively disposed towards rejecting information that challenges your worldview because you're a member in a group. And we all have emotional stake in belonging to and affirming our membership in these groups. And that influences how we interpret information. And that points out some pretty serious limitations to frameworks for sustainability, which are developed uncritically from these hegemonic positions. The vulnerabilities exposed by climate change offer an, an opportunity to write different stories. But if entrenched practices of accumulation and alienation are at stake, so too is our possibility to participate in writing our own story. Yeah. I'm going to end really early, because I thought my talk was only supposed to be 15 minutes long, and I found out this morning that we get 45 minutes. So uh, yeah. <laughs> if it, um, it was supposed to be about new materialism, so if anyone was particularly interested in that, I'm happy to talk about that. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, right, so I need another minute to think about this before I could get the question out elegantly, but um, so the fault line on a lot of this stuff is basically kind of Popper going into Ferraband going into Latour, right? This question, to what degree are the facts socially constructed? So there are basically two ways of approaching the climate change question, one of which is the kind of hard technocratic approach where we just figure out how much resource we have and then we start figuring out how we're going to carve it up. And the other is an approach which is more in the kind of Donnell Meta system thinking approach, which basically says we got into this mess because of how we handled the available facts. And unless you change the interpretation matrices, matrices into which the facts are inserted, you're going to get another wave of problems from it. And this is often mischaracterized as being objective and subjective, but it looks to me more like it's questions about the data versus questions about the processing of the data. Could you kind of explore in that direction, talk a little bit about objectivity and what it means in this context? Sure. Um, so you started by 
The, the first option there, when you said, we will decide what we're going to cut up, for example, who is the we there? Like, it's, it's actually a very small group of people. Um, so, uh, I'm more in the Latour camp when it comes to the uh, construction of these facts. Um, and I think the subject-object question is really undone when you start looking at, um, uh, here, I have a slide, actually. Um, in quantum physics, for example, you have this problem now where the, ob the, the object of study is reacting to being studied, apparently. So, Exactly. Uh, definitely in the social sciences, it's this um, double hermeneutics, they call it, where like you are interpreting someone else's interpretations, and if they know that you're doing it, then they will be changing them, their behavior because they know that they're being watched. But the interesting thing is that it might not be only humans that behave that way. Um, and in fact, it might not be only living matter that behaves that way, which would be pretty interesting. We've always assumed that it was pretty passive. I'm not sure if I answered your question at all. <laughs> because the objective subjective frame doesn't really go anywhere. But there is a question about data and analysis of data. So if we all broadly agree that the machinery that we'll have for producing fact in things like large scale climate stuff is within an order of magnitude correct. Uh, we still have this question about whether we accept the facts as we currently have them and then start carving, or whether we go further into the questions of how do we wind up with this set of facts rather than asking different questions, getting in different results. Uh. So the collection of theoretically objective data versus the uh, analytical frameworks into which we put the data, where do you put the weight to get the thing to move? If That's that a great sense. question. And I, th I think it's different from the objective-subjective question. Oh, definitely. Data versus analysis, I think, is a better way of splitting kind of the mess. It is a good question, especially since where would you put the weight? Because obviously, they, I, I would argue they both need to be happening. Um, and certainly the argument in this presentation is that um, charging ahead in terms of uh, just using the data and uh, not questioning the frameworks that you're using um, to create meaning out of that data uh, is problematic, especially when it is such a small group of people that have uh, tend to have a very similar worldview that are the ones interpreting the data. So it, maybe my argument would be that we definitely need to be interpreting this data and moving forward on initiatives, but there should be a lot more inclusion of different voices in that process. Um, and a lot of different worldviews involved in how we're going to interpret that data. Which is difficult when uh, so much of it is being, becoming corporate as well. There's not a lot of transparency and there's not a lot of opportunity for marginalized voices to participate. And I guess furthermore, my point there is that it's not just about fairness when we talk about including other voices. The point is that they, that they might actually have solutions that the hegemonic people in charge never could have thought of because of the way that they interpret information. And that, that's certainly obviously the case if we wind it backwards. You know, the, the kind of screaming about ecosystem destruction is something that ought to stop, goes back much further uh, outside of the industrial world than it does inside of the industrial world. So it's clear that the indicators were noticed and complained about, you know, maybe a century or more earlier in other cultures than in stride of the mainstream kind of industrial ecology. Mm. Um, so for those folks to turn around and say, well, if you'd listened to us the first time, we wouldn't be in that mess, maybe you should listen to us now, is a fairly reasonable claim. You know, it's not hard for that claim to be made. The, the thing that I wanted to get you to drill down on, if possible, is this. A lot of the, ah, God, this is such uh, tricky, my theory, I, I'm just swamped in theory. But the, the older approaches to 
things like ecosystem regulation largely were pre-scientific. Right, you had very poor understandings of the actual frameworks of cause and effect involved. So they might be doing the right things, but they're generally doing the right things based on very, very weak underlying models. Now we've got great models, but the models are framed entirely inside of the machinery that's causing the actual problem. And it seems like we've got this kind of thing of how do you continue to generate the useful data without also reifying all the assumptions in the industrial framework that's producing the data. And that's particularly acute when we get into things like smart cities, where you take the machinery that is without a doubt the cause of the problem, and then you attempt to get it to fix the problem. So that's kind of the, there's kind of a lump there of fog that I don't know anything about. Like, you could answer that question for me. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. No, no, I, th I don't think I've ever seen the question well framed, actually, because that, I mean, this question about how do you continue to produce accurate knowledge while questioning the underlying machinery that produces those perspectives, you know, we don't have an indigenous science really anywhere. The Indians will poke and say, well, we have kind of an indigenous science, and they'll give you some reference points, and there's something of a culture of empiricism there, but it's empiricism with about 70% woo mixed in. Mm. And if you don't have non-European empiricism, it's very hard to imagine an empiricism which isn't fundamentally grounded on European assumptions. True. And I'm certainly not a proponent of uh, rejecting empiricism. Uh, but I do think that it is not uh, enough on its own. I think it's not enough on its own because it is the uh, the quest for objective stories, which there are objective stories to be found and to be told, but they're n but not all stories are. Thank you very much for the great discussion. Okay. Yeah, so all of a sudden, there are like there are more stories. You say so. What more stories are there? What are the other stories? Since we have some time. Yeah. Well, what do you think that there is a universal human nature, for example? Was that, a, uh, was that a, a, an honest uh, question? Yes. Um, yes, of course. Hmm. How do you reconcile that with there being, for example, at least two different uh, bifurcations of our biology, being male and female? Oh, so that would uh, definitely work uh, together with, with some kind of, uh, of uh, abstract nature that would be the common of the, this bifurcation in that case, if you accept that bifurcation. Well, what would that nature be? Like what uh, is I will not try to de define, not here. OK. <laughs> Uh, uh, but uh, of course, like it will contain uh, uh, fundamental aspects, like uh, what ways are we different from other, the rest of uh, of uh, animal kingdom, and and so on and so forth. And of course, we will we will struggle in the corner cases, but we will agree on on a broad set of uh, of different aspects that, and then we can say that that body of aspects is the the human uh, nature. Hmm. Um. Non-objective stories. <laughs> uh, I was so nervous earlier. I, I went um, blank during my presentation. It's <laughs> uh, a good example. Or, or maybe the, the thing why I ask is because I, I think I probably don't understand fully. There are many, I'm just a little bit. Yeah, so, so the one that I usually use when somebody talks about this is uh, we have human bone, right? And when a bone breaks, there are lots of different things that you could try if you're going to heal the bone. So Western medicine tends to think of the bone as being hard like concrete. So we put it in a very stiff cast and we let it heal. Chinese medicine thinks of the bone as being flexible like bamboo. So they splint it with bamboo and they wiggle it around every day. And the Chinese uh, doctors say that this prevents you getting arthritis in the bone when you get older. And the result is substantially the same. It's not that one approach works and the other approach doesn't. But the different, the different mental model of what bone is changes what you wrap the bone in when you need to keep it still when it's broken. 
And whether one approach produces a better result in the long run or the other, I don't know. I haven't seen clinical data. But the model that we have in the culture of the bone then dictates the treatment of the bone when it breaks. And that, that analogy is completely unobjective. The bone is not like concrete or like wood. It's neither one. It's just a bone. But we form the analogies as a way of reasoning, and then we take action based on the analogy. And neither one is objectively correct. The bone is bone. It's not concrete or bamboo. Yeah, and when you break that bone, there's no objective scale of pain, for example, which is a big problem for people uh, like Casper's dad who works with pain. Uh, how, you know, how, how much pain are you in on a scale of one to 10? This is not impossibly impossible to make it objective, for example. But then uh, the big numbers still will, will uh, give you some, some kind of objectiveness. Some kind of objective, you, the, like relatively? But it'll be different, like everyone's five is different, and you don't really have ever any access to what someone else's five is. But you can compare, uh, so what you can always do is you can uh, ask in different situations the same people. Uh, you can ask, uh, so I read about that, uh, uh, someone uh, saying that exercise is uh, good for you, p like it keeps pain down. So if you ask before and after exercise, and then you will get different answers for of something that would like, uh, and and uh, and um, so you can okay. So it's what, what I say can still be useful, such a measurement though not being objective. Yes, I would argue there are lots of uh, non-objective measurements that are useful. <laughs> well, there's um, art, so there's that. Um, <laughs> the world of non-objectivity, really. Uh, and also, it's interesting that you said um, the same person. You can ask the same person over time, and you might get some sort of benchmark about how they measure their pain. But the idea of being the same person is a little strange, considering that we're changing all the time. So you're not exactly the same person you were the last time you were asked. OK, uh, then I take back and uh, say yes instead. Uh, Phrase it like uh, ask a similar crowd in several with several in several occasions. How do you decide if they're similar or not? It's not so important. Like on what grounds? So I think uh, the conclusion where I want to get at is that uh, okay, so so from uh, uh, from those fuzzy measurements, we still can make uh, make uh, societal assumptions on like what uh, type of medicine that should be subsidized uh, and make political decisions. And in that case, like that definitely has an objective claim. I, I don't see how that makes it an objective claim. Politics is inherently subjective. It's all about negotiating different viewpoints, right? Mm -hmm. If it was objective, there wouldn't be any politics. We'd know exactly what we needed to do. Yes, OK. So this is why I ask uh, the question because I, I think that uh, like to me it's it, it's a little bit confusing and indeed I, like some examples would be would be good. Uh, I'm not sure if I can come up with any examples of. Uh, of uh, you know objective uh, sampling of individuals. Actually, I wanted to back up a little bit to uh, something we said a little bit earlier about uh, the difference between uh, humanity and the rest of nature, um, because it's there's really no agreement. Well, as I see it, th there's this like traditional uh, agreement that. Uh, that uh, we are different from uh, animals because we, uh, what do we say nowadays? That we have, uh, co well, co do we really know if uh, animals have conscious? I would argue they definitely do. Uh, see, <laughs> what I was thinking that uh, what, what the current story might be is that uh, we are different from animals because we have the uh, self-reflection to uh, uh, see that we are dis destructive even though we continue to be destructive. 
uh, as my best approach at the current story. Uh, does anybody have a better one? I'd love to hear them. I would argue that there is no difference in kind between humans and animals. There's differences in degree. Well, I think one fundamental difference is that we can talk about and record our past and also worry about the future in a way that other animals can't. So far as we know, but yeah. Well, yeah. as far as we've been able to tell, and I, oh, I think we've done quite well on uh, establishing the language of animals too, so yeah. What about the language of mycelium? Um, well, it's, um, it might be that they are having deep conversations too. But, uh, it's also why we create um, many of the laws that we do, wh why it's, uh, some things are um, deeply immoral, um, <laughs> which would not be immoral for other animals. It's because uh, well, we, uh, since we can talk about them, we can fear them in a way that other animals can't. Hmm. Good point. Uh, I'm arguing that uh, th the concept of morality is very human, and uh, the reason why we have it is because we can reflect on the past and think and worry about the future. So uh, elephants will visit the bones of dead elephants mm. and they'll introduce younger elephants who never knew the dead elephant to the bones of the old elephant by putting their trunks on the teeth, which is how the elephants greet each other. They basically touch each other's teeth like shaking hands and they'll do this with relatives at grave sites. So they've remembered the grave, they've remembered the individual and they're doing cultural transmission intergenerationally to introduce a living elephant to an elephant that died before it was born. Without any shadow of doubt, if that's the criteria, they're human. Right? If, if, if this is the thing that makes us separate from the animals, it turns out it doesn't make us separate from the animals. Uh, dolphins appear to have names. They're capable of making a squeaking noise down a telephone that tells another dolphin who's on the other end of the phone. They say their names and then the other dolphin repeats it back and then they kind of do the little thing. And, you know, it's, like it's obviously language, right? It's completely, obviously, language. The, the animals have languages. B uh, what do you call those things? Uh, prairie dogs, right? 50 different squeaking noises, each one of which uniquely identifies a particular kind of predator. If they see a, a raven, or not a raven, a, a whatever it be, a, a kite, a hawk, they make a particular squeaking noise that refers to that thing. And if you show them another one of those things, it's the same squeak. We have a name for that. It's called a word, right? It's a word. It's a thing that an animal uses. And you know, once you accept that the animals all have languages and they're speaking to each other all the time, it becomes pretty easy to understand how the world really works. We just have this incredible kind of Eurocentric insanity that suggests that the animals are not actually talking. All the other cultures in the world are perfectly aware the animals have language. It's just a unique obtuseness inside of the European sphere, probably based on biblical precepts, that gives people the belief that this is not language and the animals are in some way different. We're overcoming the things that the Bible told us about nature every single day. Um, it's obviously words. So new materialism is uh, non-anthropocentric, by the way. <laughs> Suggestion. Uh, wouldn't that be the the um, ultimate anthropocentric uh, way thing to to do? To claim that whatever uh, we can experience as other animals uh, sharing a language, as a language. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, we're not attributing. Uh, it's not anthropomorphizing if they indeed are speaking something that we would categorize as a language. Um, I don't see how it's anthropocentric to recognize that they are, that they are behaving in these ways.
So I think we're kind of into something here that that uh, becomes uh, hard to talk about, mainly because we don't think along those lines uh, in in the start. So you're mentioning that this might be anthrop anthropomorphizing. God, what a difficult word. The uh, the animals, uh, but really what you're arguing is that the because they have language, they are anthropomorphizing themselves, <laughs> which is sort of calling the chicken the egg or something. You know, if they had languages that's uh, independent from ours, then it's not anthropo anything. Um, and uh, the reason why it's hard to talk about is I think it's hard to think about because as Vina uh, mentioned, we're stuck in a model, like a, I don't know if it's even a European model, it's more like a, a Western model or uh, a, a old science model of uh, we must conquer uh, nature. But that's the model that, that we're still sort of, our brain patterns are going we must conquer nature, uh, like all we must get rid of all the bugs and make it as comfortable as possible for humans to, to live. Uh, and, you know, the only thing we need forests for and other things are for resources. And uh, I think maybe that makes it easier to, uh, you know, eat cheese, drink milk, have, uh, for, for those who are aren't veg vegetarian, eat lots and lots of meat without ever thinking about the, you know, nature is and I think the same thing. It's easier maybe for me to challenge the, um, the category of the human because females for so long weren't really considered fully human. So our allegiance to the category should not be taken for granted. I'm very happy that uh, this presentation turned out to be a uh, debate and uh, you got to contribute to this topic. So yes, thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> thank you for the presentation. And uh, we are going to have another pres um, speaker here at 6 o'clock. So please come back. Thank you.